names are musicians. I am not a musician. I just happen to be able to strum a few chords on the guitar. I am not a musician. I get nervous and I get scared and I'd much rather preach, so you're in for it today. Okay? <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 18. No, really, I do. I get I get so nervous when I'm gonna shake, shake, shake the wiggles out. Okay, here we go. Psalm 18 we're gonna look at today. Um, we have gone through uh all the way from Psalm 11 through Psalm 18 this summer, various times, had a few stops in between. Um, just wanted to just want to celebrate this. Last week, how many of you were at the beach with us last week for our service? We baptized 21 people last week. And what, what a blessing to see people want to make that commitment to Christ. And as we've gone through the Psalms, you know, the Lord has certainly uh, spoken to me through these Psalms this summer, and, and I hope they've been a blessing to you. As we come to Psalm 18 today, let me say this. How many of you know that things change, don't they? They change a lot, especially technologically. I mean, it seems like every time you get a new technical toy, it is obsolete when you open it. And if you don't know how to use technological toys, just ask a five-year-old. They can figure it out. Um, they do. They change a lot. And I read this story this week after a family, after deciding to replace their automobile, uh, decided that what they were going to do, the best course of of action was to buy themselves a brand new minivan. So they did. They went out, they, they bought it. They knew it would be expensive, but they planned on taking really good care of this vehicle, making it last for many, many years. So it was brand new, and while it was virtually brand new, they decided to take a trip, and they went driving. And, and um, what happened was the serpentine belt, if you know what that is, that's a, a belt that really drives everything with the power steering, the alternator, the water pump, all those things. It broke, and so they pulled it into, they had somebody look at it, and they took it back to the dealer, and the dealer said, look, don't you worry, we're going to fix this for you, and it'll be like a brand new car again, and so they fixed it, and it ran okay, and a few days later, they um, they were driving along, they were actually on the way home from a church picnic, and all of a sudden, this great, the sky just opened up, and this great storm came, and hail came down from the skies, big pieces of hail, and started pounding on their brand new minivan. And so now it had kind of a dimpled look, you know. And so after that, they were driving downtown one day, and as they were parked at a red light, someone smashed right into the back of that van and um, damaged it even further. After about two months, they just decided they weren't even going to ever wash the thing again. (laughs) This new car that they had gotten, it aged... And it changed rapidly in a very, very short time. And, and the truth of the matter is, last week, uh, Jan and Floyd celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And I got to thinking about two things when I thought about that. Number one, my, hasn't a lot changed in 50 years? And then the other thing I thought about, my, isn't Jan amazing for putting up with Floyd for 50 years? <laughs> anyway, some change is good. Some change is very good. Some changes not so good. Some changes are very welcomed, and other changes are not so welcome. But one of the greatest comforts for a believer in Christ, living in these crazy, troubled days, is the confidence that we can have that God never, ever changes. Theologians call this attribute of God His immutability. It's the fact, Charles Ryrie defines it as, immutability means that God is unchanging, and unchangeable. And I know that a lot of people try and change our idea of God. Watch the news one night and you'll see a lot of people trying to change our idea of who God is. But the truth of the matter is, God does not change. James puts it this way. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And and when we come to Psalm 18... To me, the overwhelming attribute of God we can see through this psalm is the fact that He is unchanging and unchangeable. We're going to read several of the verses. Look at Psalm 18, verse 1. The Bible says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. 
If you go down to verse 46, David writes, The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From violent men, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and to his descendants forever. This is the longest of the Psalms we've studied yet. And we're going to read the whole thing, but we're going to kind of take it in shorter, uh, bite-sized pieces. But it's 50 verses. And it was probably written at the end of David's life. Picture this. David has lived a full life. He has ruled for 40 years. And he's looking at all that God has done. And he's thanking God for it. He's, he's just praising God for the glorious works that God has performed. And all of his blessings through the years. And in this psalm, he uses several metaphors to portray his faith in God and who God is, such as it's his strength, his shield, the horn of his salvation, his fortress, his deliverer, his stronghold, and his rock. And the most important of these, and really the theme of this psalm, is the fact that the Lord was David's rock. It occurs twice in verse 2, later on in verse 31, and, and then in verse 46, and If we read it together, this is what they would say. David writes, the Lord is my rock. My God is my rock. Who is the rock except our God? And praise be to my rock. Now the question then comes up, well, how is God like a rock? God is firm. God is strong. God is solid. God is impregnable. God is immovable. God is powerful. Yesterday, my wife and I went on this long trip, and my boys too, and and it was really my attempt to get my wife to visit Darwin, Minnesota to see the biggest ball of twine. But we had to do some other things for her to agree with it. So we went to a couple places, you know, her part, she got to go to a couple stores, you understand that, you know. And then it was okay, you know, she went to her stores, and then we went, took the boys to this jump bounce house, and then we had lunch, that was as much my part too, um... And then we uh, went down to see the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. Then on the way back, we stopped at this place called Quarry Park, right outside of St. Cloud. And it is this old rock quarry that is nothing but granite. And in it, they've filled it up with water. And it's actually, the quarry is where you swim is 116 feet deep. But all around it, there's nothing but just big, thick, strong, powerful rock. And some of these crazy people were jumping off the rock into the water from like 30 feet high. JJ said, Dad, can I jump? I said, don't even ask. It's not happening. (laughs) Dad, are you going to jump? Man, I'm not even getting in the water, let alone jumping from it. I finally did get in the water. But, But as you looked around, there was this rock that had hundreds of people on it. And not once were we ever concerned that that rock was going to give way. Because it was a rock. It was powerful. It was strong. And and as David writes about a rock, he writes about this rock that is large enough that he could hide on top of it so his enemies couldn't see him. A, a rock that was large enough that he could hide below so he could escape the elements. It's this picture of this huge rock that is hard and so strong that no one can damage it. I thought about this when I was studying this this week. I thought about the Rock of Gibraltar. Have you ever seen that? Maybe you've seen it in the Prudential commercials. I mean, that is a huge, huge mountainous rock. And, and it's the idea that this rock has been there since God created it. And it will always remain the same. And that's the kind of God we have. We have a strong, enduring, trustworthy, powerful God that will always be there when we need Him. You may remember these commercials. How many of you, how many of you are Chevy people? Are you any Chevy people? A couple of you? Okay, good. Remember this this, this advertisement for Chevy Silverados, like a rock. When I was in Florida, it was really fun to see the rednecks. And they were either Chevy people or Ford people. And they all drove these trucks. And I, they'd be like, are you a Chevy man or a Ford man? I'm like, Toyota. Um, you know, I'm not a real man anyway. So, but for 10 years, 
For 10 years, these ads ran on TV, this Like a Rock campaign. And they kind of talked about the Silverado as if it was the most dependable, long-lasting truck that is on the road. And they even used a song by Bob Seger. It was licensed. And it ran for 10 years. It is the longest running and most successful ad campaign in the history of ad campaigns. And think about it. David is saying to us, when I look at God, I see Him like a rock. Firm. Impenetrable. Strong and powerful. So how did God, or excuse me, how did David see God like a rock? There's a couple of things I want to share with you. The first thing is David saw God as rock because of his deliverance. Because of the fact that he delivered him. Look at your Bibles in Psalm 18 verse 4. David writes, The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From His temple He heard my voice. My cry came before Him into His ears. The earth trembled and quaked. And the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because He was angry. Smoke rose from His nostrils. A consuming fire came from His mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under His feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemies, great bolts of lightning and routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils, He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. In other words, the Lord was my rock. And so after David expresses his praise to God for being his rock, he talks about the trouble he was in, and that when he called, God began to act on his behalf. Throughout the psalm, you see these words, deliver and rescue and save over and over again. They're found in several verses. And to David, God's deliverance was like a rock because he knew that God delivers us when we call on Him. See, David was delivered from his enemies. David learned about God's deliverance when he was even just a little boy, when he was young. He was a young age when God delivered him from the danger of of facing a lion and a bear while he was tending sheep. In fact, he would say this in 1 Samuel 17, when he was getting ready to face Goliath, Saul would say, you you can't do this, you're just a young boy. And he said, look, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And as you read through David's life, you find out again and again God delivered David. He delivered him from the hand of King Saul when he tried to kill him. He delivered him from all of Israel's enemies. He even delivered him from the rebellion of his own son, Absalom. And and again, just delivered him over and over. And in this psalm, this deliverance is kind of seen like a great storm coming on or, or like a warrior in a chariot. In other words, the picture is this, is that David is in trouble. And David knows his God. And so when David, in his trouble, calls to his God, God steps up quick to help. I mean, yesterday, i got to tell you, I, I, I am, how do I put this? I'm a nervous parent when it comes to my kids. I really am. It's supposed to be the other way around. You know, dads are supposed to be cool and let kids, you know, do all these crazy things. Not my kids. I, my wife was like, yeah, go ahead and do what you want. I'm like, no, you can't do it. You might get hurt. Yesterday, my boys, we went in this quarry. They just jumped right in the water. Come on in, Dad. I am not getting in that water. So Janine got in. She's with the boys. She says, don't you want to come in? I'm like, no, you know what? I can watch better from right up here. That was my excuse because I was afraid. You know. Um, but you know what? One, once or twice, I watched Jace, knowing how deep this water was, I watched Jace go under the water. And even knowing that he was doing it on purpose, I mean, my first response was, I was ready to jump in the water and get him. But at the very least, to call out, Janine, save Jace! You know, something like that. But but I was ready 
at a moment's notice. And if you're a parent, you understand what I'm talking about. When you hear your child scream, last night, I was sitting on the couch after this long day, and, and I was just sitting there doing nothing. It was wonderful. No TV on, not reading, just sitting there like this. Janine and Jace were downstairs. The boys were getting showers. And I heard, I knew JJ was in the shower, and I heard this loud. And I casually got up and walked. JJ, are you okay? No, you better believe it. I ran up those stairs faster than you've ever seen a white boy move. I mean, I ran up those stairs to make sure he was okay. Because I'm in tune with that as a parent. Now listen to me, folks. We all go through struggles. We all go through hard times. We all have difficulties in our lives. But understand this. God, when He calls Himself your Father, has committed Himself to care for you. And when you're in trouble and you call on Him, you better believe He is ready, willing, and able to rescue you. The Bible says this, that no weapon that is formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me. God is saying, look, I have got this under control. I will care for you. So David was delivered from his enemies. But you know, the truth of the matter is, whatever you're facing today, God can deliver you. But the most important deliverance God offers is deliverance from our sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is what? Say that a little bit louder. The wages of sin is what? Death. And that doesn't mean that we just die. When the Bible uses that word death, it means eternal separation from God. It means that we will be eternally, forever separated from God. That is the penalty, that is the wages, that is the payment on sin. But I'm so glad the verse doesn't stop there. Because it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Or, I love this verse, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's deliverance offered. Deliverance from sin through Jesus Christ. You see, when we receive Christ, we get delivered from the penalty of sin. We can no, we no longer have that penalty hanging over us. Rather, we have eternal life with God in heaven. But you know, the truth is, as we walk with Him every day, He begins to deliver us from the power of sin. And we begin to overcome temptation, waiting for the day when... God will deliver us from the very presence of sin in His kingdom. So David knew God was strong and He was a rock because He would always deliver whenever He called on Him. And folks, the same is true with us. God will deliver us if we'll call on Him. Then David saw God as a rock because of His righteousness. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, He brought me into a spacious place. He rescued me because He delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, He has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from my God. All His laws are before me. I have not turned away from His decrees. I have been blameless before Him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in His sight. To the faithful, you will show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you will show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. Now David was not perfect. And by the way, nor are we. But David was a man, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. According to 1 Samuel in the book of Acts. And he was a man with a shepherd's heart, much like God has. And here's what David learned. David learned that as he was faithful to the Lord, the Lord faithfully cared for his every need. The Lord faithfully took care of him. And he learned that God rewards us when we obey him. Now, I want you to say something with me. And especially if you're a young person, like under the age of 30, because that's really young, you know. But if you're, listen, I want you to say something with me. I want you to repeat it. I'm going to say that. I want you to repeat it. Ready? This is the phrase. God always blesses obedience. Okay, all kids ready to say that? Are you ready? God always blesses obedience. 
Let's try one more time. Parents, I'm trying to help you out here, okay? All right? Here we go, one more time. God always blesses obedience. He does, over and over. And by the way, I have not only see this in Scripture, but I've seen it in my own life. I remember when I was living in Florida, and I had been a youth pastor for seven years, and the truth is, as ministry goes, things were pretty good. We had a very solid youth group. We, we knew the kids. We had, we had known them for seven years at that point. We were working with them. The Lord was just blessing. It was good. And, and in my lap, someone dropped this idea. The, the principal of our Christian school had been fired. And someone said, you should be the principal. My first response was, not a chance. But God began to work on my heart. And even, and I knew it was the Lord when my wife said, you know, it might be okay. Now, the benefit was she had to work for me then. You know, that was kind of cool. But anyway, but, but here I am. I'm, I'm, I've been in ministry for, for seven years as a youth pastor. God is blessed. I'm having fun. Things are kind of good. And God begins to tell me, you know what, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take this job on top of being the youth pastor. And I, I mean, all the things run through my mind. I have all the arguments. Well, you know what? I'm their kid's youth pastor. I don't want to be their school principal. They'll look at me different. They'll want to call me. All these things, all the things that made perfect sense went through my brain. And God kept saying, but this is what I want you to do. So eventually I said yes. And I'll never forget. I mean, by the way, this is not, sometimes churches, and this is not a knock on this church, it's a unique experience. But sometimes churches like to take a young guy and figure he's got a lot of energy, so let's just give him everything that no one else wants to do. And, and make them do it, and that's why a lot of guys burn out in their first ministry position. It wasn't, that was not the case here. And I knew it was God's plan. And so I said yes, and I remember the first day I, I, I posted on Facebook that, you know, I'm beginning a new chapter in my life where I'm not only going to be youth pastor, but I will be high school principal. And I'm not kidding you, within about five minutes, one of my best friends, Brad Raby, called me. And these are the words he said to me when he read my Facebook post about being the principal of this church. He was also a youth pastor at a church with a Christian school. He said, are you nuts? I said, I said, Brad, I'm telling you, it's God telling me to do this. He goes, you better be sure. Because that's just crazy doing both. I said, Brad, I'm telling you, I know it's God. And I don't want to do it but I have to obey. And you know what? Just as a testimony to the Lord's power, I stepped in. It wasn't always easy, but God worked in that school. And it was a year later that I was here as pastor. And so God used that situation to bless me and my family and lead and guide us. So what I'm telling you is this. God blesses obedience. And, and we see in this passage that although God's character never changes, and his covenants don't change. He's immutable. But we do see that God's dealing with us is often determined by the condition of our own hearts. Think about it. Aren't you glad that God deals with his children through grace? See, God delighted in David. Kind of the way a parent delights in their children as they grow, as they mature in, in character and obedience and service. And, and as a parent, I understand, I'm starting to understand that watching my kids grow, that's why David, that's why God looked at David. David knew God's law, he obeyed it, and in spite of his difficulty sometimes, he obeyed God. And so God blessed him. And again, remember this, the way that sometimes God relates to us has to do with the condition of our hearts. Think about David for a minute. David was merciful to Saul. And so God was merciful to David. David was loyal, and so God was faithful to him. And he kept his promises, and he blessed him. David wasn't sinless, but he was blameless in his motives. In other words, he wanted nothing more than for God to be glorified in everything he did. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus put it this way, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the pure in heart does not mean people were perfect, but it does mean those whose hearts are completely dedicated to God, those who really want to follow Him, those whose desire is to be His follower and His disciple. However, you know what I've found and I'm so grateful for? Even when as God's child I'm obstinate and I want to do what I want to do, 
I found that God graciously calls me back to Himself. There's a beautiful picture of that in the Bible. It's called the story of the prodigal son. Now this son went and wasted his inheritance, and that father never gave up on him. And he waited for that son to come back to him. And when he got there, you know the story, he killed the fatted calf and had a big party because he was so excited that his son had returned. Why? Why would God do that? Because here's what Scripture says in 2 Timothy. That if we are faithless, He will remain faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. So listen, God deals with His children through grace, but we do need to understand the flip side of this. And that is that God deals with the wicked through justice. Now if you're like me, and maybe you are, you look at this world filled with violence and poverty and extreme injustice, and maybe you cry out to God like I sometimes do and like Scripture people did. You say, how long, O oh Lord? How long is this going to last? Even this week, you may have heard on the news. I mean, I just read this the other day. In Spokane, Washington, there was an 88-year-old World War II veteran who had received a Purple Heart. By all accounts, he was a man that just loved people and helped people every chance he got. Several people he helped get back on their feet financially and things like that. Gave him jobs. His name was Delbert Shorty Belton. And uh, Wednesday night, he was just walking out of his, I think it was a VFW or something like that, and two teenage boys attacked him and beat him so savagely that he died. 88-year-old man. And you look at things like that, and if we can just be really honest, sometimes it's enough to make people question the existence of God, or at the very least his motives or his character. But what we have to remember, folks, is this. That our God of love our God of grace, whom we celebrate for those things, and we should, we have to remember He is also a God of holiness and He is a God of ultimate justice. Proverbs says this way, the Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayer of the righteous. What we find out in this passage is that God will bring low all those who are haughty, all those who are wicked. The idea is that there's coming a day, folks, when all wrongs will be righted, and He will bring all to justice and to judgment. The Bible says it this way, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done in his body, whether good or bad. And that passage is speaking of the believer, but it's also taught in the Bible that we will all stand one day before God and give an account for our lives. And when we understand that, it still ought to break our hearts. It, truthfully, it ought to make us angry. There's good anger and bad anger, and those kind of things, they don't just make us angry. But when we remember that everyone will give an account before the perfect judge, you know what? Then we can begin to live out Paul's instructions in Romans 12, where he says this, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. We need to understand that to exalt God's love and mercy and grace to the exclusion of God's wrath and justice and holiness, folks, that's just plain bad theology. God is a God of grace and love and mercy, and thank God for that. But you need to have the faith and and the trust that God is also a God who will right wrongs and that He will work. And He deals with the wicked through justice. So David, when he looked at God, he knew God was a rock because He delivered him over and over. He knew God was a rock because of His righteousness. And he knew God was a rock because of His mighty power. You know, God can do things that we never, ever dreamed of. How many of you could just give testimony? I want to ask that. How many of you could give testimony that God can do things that you can't? Have you, under, have you learned that in life? I mean, in fact, according to Ephesians 3.20, the Bible says He's able to do immeasurably more than we can even imagine or ask according to His power that is at work within us. And so David learned this in his life. He learned that God equips us when we submit to Him. God equipped David to be king. I mean, this, this had to be hard. Could you imagine? I mean, there had to be times when David was in that shepherd field or being chased for by King Saul when he had to question God's plan. And he had to wonder, what are you doing? 
But you know, God was at work. God was preparing him. He was equipping him to serve as Israel's king. And folks, we need to understand that while in life difficulties come, and we can't always explain why they come. We can't always explain why did this happen. I would, you know, as a pastor, I have people come to me all the time and ask that question. Why? I would love to give them the right answer. And be able to say, well, let me tell you, here's why. But the truth is, I can't do that. I can tell them God cares about them right where they are, because He does. But you know what? A lot of times, when difficulties come, what that is is God preparing us for the future. God did it over and over in the Scripture. And sometimes it takes a long time. Thirteen years God went to prepare Joseph. Forty years for Moses. Forty years for his follower Joshua. And, and even Paul in the New Testament, three years alone in the desert, God prepared him for his future. And so David learned that what God was doing during his exile was he was preparing him for the future. God was going to make him a great warrior. He was going to make him a compassionate leader. He was going to make him a godly man. But he needed to prepare him. And so my question to you and me today is this. What about you and me? What can God do through us? The truth is, now I want you to hear what I'm about to say very carefully. Folks, we can do everything God calls us to. Let me just say it one more time. We can do everything God calls us to. Now, I'm just like you. I struggle. Sometimes I question my own abilities. Um, you know, I, I get nervous when I'm playing. And that's why other people do it, and I don't do it. But you know what? Whatever God calls us to, we can do it. Now, I want to show you a verse that you've heard, and I want to just explain something to you. You probably, probably all of us could maybe even quote this. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. It's a verse that is often misapplied in a lot of different ways. Now let me, I think the New Century Version says this way, I kind of like the way it says it. It says, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me strength. That's pretty good. But then I want you to see it in, in the Amplified Bible. Paul says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Now, we hear this verse misquoted all the time, misapplied, and maybe you ask yourself, well, can we really do everything through Christ? I mean, is this kind of a blank check where God says, you can do anything you want to do as long as you throw a little Jesus in the mix? That, I mean, is that what the Bible's teaching? That's the way people certainly seem to apply it. Folks, I'm telling you, that is not what that Bible verse is teaching. What it is, is this is a wonderful promise that, listen, no matter what God calls us to, no matter what God asks us to do in our lives, we can know for sure that we can fulfill His will and His plan through His power. As we live for Jesus in this world, we will face troubles, we'll face pressures, we'll face difficulties, we'll face trials. Jesus promised it. John 16, In this world you'll have trouble. But he also said rejoice because I've overcome the world. First John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Let me close with this story. This week I, I was talking with a Dan Pullio. We were talking about a man named Athanasius. Now, uh, no, very few people name their children Athanasius anymore. But, but Athanasius was an early church father in about, I think, the third century. And there was a, there was a doctrinal error that was going through the church that had just caught on like wildfire. It was called Arianism. It was the idea that Jesus was subordinate to the Father. It was the idea that Jesus was not as, not the same as the Father. Jesus was not the same substance as the Father. That Jesus was a created being that was not exactly like the Father. In other words, it was an attack on the, the doctrine of the Trinity, an attack on, on the very character of who Jesus was. And so this man Athanasius stood against it. He said, no, Jesus is the same substance of the Father. He is part of the Godhead. And 
Once when he was teaching this, someone said to him, the whole world is against you, Athanasius. Because it looked like the entire Roman Empire was falling into this doctrinal error. But Athanasius said back to him, then it is Athanasius against the whole world. Because he knew he could do everything God called him to. C.S. Lewis wrote about this man and he said this. He said he stood for the Trinitarian doctrine, whole and undefiled, when it looked as if all the civilized world was slipping back from Christianity into the religion of Arius, into one of those sensible synthetic religions which are so strongly recommended today, and which then is now included among other devotees, many highly cultivated clergymen, it is his glory that he did not move with the times. In other words, he realized everything God called him to, he could do through the mighty power of his rock. My question today is this. What is God calling you to do through his strength? You know, I'm just one of these people who still believes God's got a plan for people's lives. And God has got a very personal, powerful plan for each and every one of our lives. God is interested in what we do. And God has got a job for you to do. And the question today is, what is God calling you to do? You may think, I can't do it, I don't have the skill, I don't have the ability. And I know I understand those thoughts, I've dealt with them myself many times. But you know what? We can stand like a rock in this world because like David, God is our rock. Firm, unpenetrable, never changing. Let's bow for prayer. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor Joel, I, I know that I have put my faith in Christ. I know that, Lord forbid, if something were to happen to me today, I'm 100% sure that I know Christ, that He's my rock, that I've experienced His salvation, and, and I'm His, I'm His child. I know it's for sure, no doubt in my mind. Would you slip that hand up in the air and let me see all over the other time? Thank you so much. You put those down. Maybe there's some who would say, you know what? I'm just going to be real honest with you. I don't know where I stand with God. I don't know if I know him personally. I certainly don't have the confidence to think that he's my rock and will always come through for me. I'm, I'm struggling. I don't know where I stand with God. You know, I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I won't come to you or make you give a speech or anything like that. But I'm the only one looking, and I, and I would like to pray for you by your need. Because so maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I don't really know where I stand with God. Would you just slip your hand in the air? Anybody at all? Man, woman, boy, or girl. God bless you. I see that hand. Is there another? I just thank you. Is there someone else? I just I don't know where I stand with God. I sure would love for you to pray for me. And so, let's consider this question today. What is God calling you to do? There's lots of needs right here within our own church body. Needs for folks to help out in Awana. Need for folks to serve in all kinds of capacities. And I believe God is calling people right now to do that. The question is, will you stand up in God's strength and answer that question? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for each one here today. Thank you so much for your goodness and the power of your word. Lord, you've even this week spoken to my heart. And so, Lord, we just thank you so much. I pray for these few folks who said today, I, you know, I don't really know where I stand with God. I don't, I don't have confidence that he's my rock. I, don't, I just don't know. Pray, Lord, that you would just draw those precious people to yourself, that they might come to understand the gospel, and they might know Jesus Christ personally, and that they might have the confidence to follow him wherever he leads. And Lord, for us that do know you, Lord, we struggle. We have times when, truthfully, Lord, we, we don't stand where we should. There are times in my life when I'm, I know you've called me to do something and I have fallen short. 
I think probably every one of us here could, could say the same thing. So Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit and your Scripture, would you help us to stand? Stand for you. knowing that we can accomplish everything you call us to do through your mighty power, because you are our rock and our fortress and our strong tower. And while we praise you today, we give you honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray.